Hi, my name is Kyle Kittleson with MedCircle, and today I'm joined by double board certified psychiatrist, Dr. Dominic Sportelli, here to tell us some of the causes of schizophrenia. Dr. Don, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for having me, Kyle. It's always a pleasure. On our series on schizophrenia, which is available at watch.medcircle.com, you explained that there were multiple causes of this disorder. I'd like to start with some of the more popular causes of schizophrenia that we're aware of. You know, I think... I think schizophrenia is, it's, when we're talking about schizophrenia, we have to understand that we're working with theories. Mm. Schizophrenia is this group of symptoms that fit the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And we know that it's something that's, that's it's, it's not common. It's only about 1% of the population, but people do fall into this consistent grouping of symptoms that we call schizophrenia. So, so everything that we're going to talk about tonight, although backed by science and a lot of epidemiologic data, it's still very theoretical. So when we're talking about schizophrenia, the, way, the best way that we can just right off the bat explain the cause is that there are multiple genetic, meaning hereditary and environmental risk factors. And when I say environmental, I mean like experience in life, right? All the things that we do to our bodies and, and that the world does to us, these will dictate our risk factors, right? So we know that schizophrenia is what we call a neurodevelopmental disorder. We certainly know that it's organic. There's something going on with neurochemistry and brain function, but this is where it gets complicated is there is no single cause. And I know that's probably so frustrating for people to hear. And it's, it's frustrating for me to hear as a, as a clinician, as a physician. But again, it's a complex gene and environment interactional process that just all comes together where people present with symptoms of schizophrenia. Understood. I think the most helpless feeling, at least emails I get, uh, are from people whose loved one is struggling with schizophrenia. Uh, and their first question is, where did this come from? And so many of them share with me that it runs in their family, their father, their grandfather, or somebody they're closely related to also showed similar symptoms. What role does genetics actually play in the cause of schizophrenia? Genetics play a huge, huge deal in this. And, and that gives us insight as doctors and researchers, because obviously if something is genetic, that means that there is information transferred from one person to the other in the genome, in the DNA of our cells. The DNA of our cells are instructions on how to build proteins and how to work, basically. So if it is something that is carried over, from one person to the other, which it is, we'll talk about stats, then we know there is something organic here. There's something physical that is going on, right? Um, and when we're talking about genetics, there are twin studies. And the twin studies show that if you have an identical twin, the likelihood, with, let's say an identical twin with schizophrenia, the likelihood that you're gonna have schizophrenia is 50%. Now, general population, 1% of the general population. So when you look at these twin studies and you say, oh my goodness, there's a 50% likelihood that an identical twin will have schizophrenia if the other one has it. That's huge, right? Mm -hmm. Compared to the general population of 1%. Um, also, if both of your parents have schizophrenia, the odds are about 40% that you will likely manifest symptoms of schizophrenia. If your siblings have it or one parent has it, it's a 10% increase that you'll have schizophrenia. And again, this is all going against that baseline of the general population is about 1%. So, you know, when we're talking about genetics, it's obviously very, very important and obviously a, a very big point. Yes, absolutely. Those are great numbers to be aware of. But like you mentioned, it's just part of what could potentially right. cause schizophrenia. I remember in a live class, you talked about the and I, and I do want to talk more about the environmental impacts mm -hmm. that um, plays into this. But I remember in class, you told me or told the viewers that drug use can create an episode of psychosis, which is not schizophrenia, but they are, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I'm going to use the bad terms, but like they're not, uh, but they are related in some way. 
So could you talk about whether or not what I just said was true or not? <laughs> and if yeah. um, and the role that drug use can play in developing or quote causing schizophrenia? Absolutely. And, you know, over the many, many, many years that we've been studying schizophrenia, we, we totally know at this point that there are certain substances that can induce psychosis. Now, remember when we talked about psychosis, psychosis is a symptom, very much in the same way that fever is a symptom, right? But it's sort of a general thing. Now, psychosis is this disorganized thought process. It's, it's hallucinations, delusions, perceptual disturbances. But there are certain substances that if we ingest or take, it can cause psychosis. Now, the, the issue is that some people that experience psychosis with a substance, or it's called a substance-induced psychosis, sometimes it's not transient. Sometimes that psychosis will last even though the, the drug wears off. And that's where things get really complex and scary. And then we say to ourselves as researchers and doctors, like, you know, did the drug cause it or was this an effect of an underlying psycho, mm. like an underlying problem like schizophrenia where the drug or the substance sort of brought it to the surface, right? Um, so the, the question remains, right? Is it, was it the cause or sort of the effect? But what, with regard to substances, Kyle, we know for certain that there's this kind of hierarchy of substances that we know can induce psychosis and subsequently a schizophrenic type presentation. And that hierarchy is cannabis, right? And we've studied cannabis for a really long time. It's getting really popular these days. So we know a lot more about it and we know a lot more about the cannabinoid system. And we know that the cannabinoid system does play with dopamine in the brain, which, which is one of our theories of what's going on with schizophrenia. So People that use cannabis, especially people that use cannabis at a young age, like in their adolescence, before their brains are fully developed, most of the literature supports about a four to six fold increase in potential for developing something like schizophrenia down the line, right? Um, the other, med the other I was going to call them medicines, but the other substances are hallucinogens. Mm. And hallucinogens are that category of substances that when you take, you lose touch with reality for a little while. And some examples of this are lysergic acid or LSD, magic mushrooms or psilocybin, um, MDMA can be considered a, or, or ecstasy, you know, can be considered um, a hallucinogen, uh, um, peyote. There's, there's a lot of them, mescaline. A lot of these sort of hallucinogenic um, or entheogens, there's a lot of names for them, but can induce a psychotic state that just doesn't go away mm -hmm. in potentially a sensitive individual and somebody that, that might be predisposed to, you know, manifesting something like schizophrenia. And the, the next drug in the class would be amphetamines. Amphetamines, believe it or not, stimulants, central nervous system stimulants at high doses for long periods of time can cause a schizophrenia type presentation that sometimes does not go away. So cannabis, hallucinogens, and stimulants. Just a couple of other thoughts are, you know, just about any substance can induce a psychosis if you take too much, right? And we do know you know, that people that, that um, are diagnosed with psychosis and schizophrenia do tend to drink more alcohol. Um, they tend to smoke more cigarettes. You know, they use other things as well. But, you know, cannabis, hallucinogens, and amphetamines are the ones that we see are, they sort of have that, we call it the two-hit hypothesis, right? And the two-hit hypothesis, as we talked about in some of our series, is that someone is genetically predisposed to this or has a severe environmental load that we'll talk about, like maybe like trauma or something like that. And then they take something like a stimulant or lots of stimulants, hallucinogens or uh, lots of cannabis, and it sort of kind of manifests as schizophrenia. It's really incredible the power of what you just said, because I think when people think of substance abuse or drug use, they think of, well, I don't want the person I love to overdose and I don't want the person I love to become addicted. And there is this other, uh, you know, option here of heightening or releasing an otherwise asymptomatic uh, mental health condition going on. I remember when I was a, a really young, I don't know, maybe 10 or 11 or something, uh, my dad told me a story about somebody he knew who uh, was picked up on the side of the road, barking like a dog, mm. uh, thinking, believing that he was actually a dog. And it was a, I'm assuming, I don't know, but some psychosis or something going on from, from drug use. But 
he never got out of that. Yeah. And years later, I actually met that guy uh, where he was being cared for in a home and there was absolutely no attachment to reality. Mm -hmm. um, there was constant statements that I'm the president of the United States or that you know he killed somebody the day before and all of these grandiose statements. And at a young age, I realized, okay, so drugs aren't just, oh, you might you know, have fun on Friday or you might risk becoming addicted. There are long-term impacts that you may not be able to reverse. And I share that story for people watching and listening, not to scare people, but really for those parents and caregivers, if there is a familial history from what Dr. Dom just shared with us of schizophrenia or psychosis, then your child who may experiment with pot may have a heightened risk for having other types of negative consequences. So there's, there's a lot of power here with learning this education because that type of information allows parents to make informed decisions based on what's happening with their family and not what they just hear on TV or, you know, hear on the news and then think it applies to them. This is very specific and unique for each individual. So this is great. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. Yeah, really good point. And you know what, Kyle, don't forget, I work in the emergency department in the psych emergency department. And I see very, very often, too often, you know, more often than I want to see, I see adolescents and young adults and adults for that matter, who, who are indulging in substance use and whether it's stimulants or, you know, anything really. And, you know, it can trigger all types of, you know, psychiatric sequelae, whether it's mania, severe depression, delusion, paranoia. I mean, even alcohol withdrawal will make you paranoid and delusional, you know? So, you know, there are a lot of substances that will, will cause some psychiatric issues that I think a lot of people don't really pay attention to, um, you know, closely. And, you know, that gentleman that you sort of talked about this, you know, this guy that was barking like a dog and, mm -hmm. and, you know, was, was using a lot of substances. The question remains, right? Like, was this someone that, you know, had an underlying psycho psychotic issue and, you know, these drugs brought it out? Was this someone that was suffering from, you know, um, a psychiatric issue that abused substances to self-medicate? Right. Was this someone that had no symptoms prior to using these drugs? And it's right. sort of, you know, added fuel to the fire and made it happen. It's hard to know, but I could promise you one thing. It certainly didn't help. No. Um, let's talk about the environmental causes that you briefly mentioned at the top of this interview of schizophrenia. How does that work? Yeah, there's some really, really interesting data with regard to environment. And again, when we talk about an environment, it's it's the life you're living. It's it's the life you're living. And actually, the substances that we just talked about fall into environment because if you're using these substances, mm. you're putting yourself more at risk. But you know, some of the other things with regard to environment are something called um, adverse childhood experiences, and they we call them ACEs, ACEs. You know, when children experience severe trauma or childhood abuse or neglect, it raises that risk of future potential for psychosis and schizophrenia. So, you know, we, we absolutely know that, you know, a child that goes through some really, really difficult and challenging, you know, early um, developmental problems has a potential for something like psychosis. But, you know, there's some really interesting data out there. Like, do you know that there's something called the seasonal affect where, when we do data and we look at epidemiological data, people that are born in winter or spring tend to have a higher potential likelihood for something like schizophrenia. And, you know, we don't really know why we have some theories as to this. And one is a viral theory uh, being that, you know, those times of year could potentially make the either the mother. So, you know, carrying the fetus or a newborn child exposed to more viruses. So there's a thought of potential a viral sort of insult that happens at a very young developmental age. Um, there's also low birth weight or prenatal complications. You know, all of these things put you in a higher risk stratification when it comes to schizophrenia, malnutrition. Mm -hmm. So there was, there are times in history um, where there were famines. And uh, when you look back at that data, the individuals that were born during those famines had a much higher likelihood of developing schizophrenia, which leads us to think that, you know, maybe malnutrition had a part of this as well. So, um, you know, develop, the, development, the developing brain um, is very sort of sensitive. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a sensitive thing. So malnutrition, um, 
any sort of prenatal compromise, even things like hypoxia, which means that, you know, uh, you lose oxygen to the brain for a certain amount of time. These are all things that have been implicated into a higher potential likelihood for schizophrenia in the future. But remember, all of these things, it's this multiple sort of, and again, I'll use that term, the perfect storm. It's this, it's this perfect storm of things that all sort of come together to um, raise your risk of schizophrenia and eventually potentially manifesting with symptoms consistent with schizophrenia. This has been incredibly informative. And I know there are viewers and watchers of this right now saying, okay, that was good information, but now I have more questions. And I find that happens a lot when you start to get educated about these complicated topics. Dr. Dominic Sportelli has a few great series on schizophrenia and psychosis. Those are available at watch.medcircle.com and use the links below. I'm also gonna uh, provide an inside look to one of those series at the end of this video. Dr. Dom, I'm excited to uh, see you tonight for our live panel. I'm excited for people to get the chance to really ask you questions and get those clarifying answers. Again, this is not treatment or therapy. This is mental health education. Dr. Dom, final words on uh, schizophrenia and the causes. Well, listen, it's a scary thing, right? Because, you know, um, schizophrenia is sort of like that. When people think of the word insanity, you know, mm -hmm. schizophrenia is kind of what comes to mind. And it's, and it's very, very frightening. And I want people to remember that it's, it's 1% of the population, mm -hmm. despite what we've talked about with some things that will raise your risk. But I also want people to know that people with schizophrenia can live a very normal life. It is a spectrum just like anything else. Yeah. So, you know, and there's, there's some really, really amazing treatments out there nowadays. So, you know, I always want people to remain hopeful. If you have family, friends, loved ones that may have been diagnosed with something like schizophrenia, there's certainly hope and some really, really cutting edge treatments out there now. Wonderful. Well, we'll see you tonight. I'm Kyle Kittleson. Remember, whatever you're going through, you got this. And here is an inside look into Dr. Dom's series. If I was walking down the street and a woman came up to me and she said, I am so depressed. I'm on my, I think I'm gonna kill myself, can you help me? I would say yes, I'd get out my phone, I'd call 911, I'd wait with her, she'd go to the emergency room mm -hmm. and hopefully she got help. If a woman came up to me and said, uh, are you the king of England mm. and you know, was mm -hmm. exhibiting mm -hmm. symptoms of schizophrenia, I would move around that person right. and continue on with right. my day. Now both people gave clear clear signs of a mental health disorder that can be treated yeah. Yeah. and one I would help and one I would ignore. It's such a profound insight, Kyle, and I think that's the stigma is we're afraid of it. We see it crazy. Yeah. They're just crazy. Yeah. Or just on crazy. a drug trip or whatever. Yeah, so and maybe they are on a drug trip or whatever. Hopeless. But, yep. Not going to help this person anyway. Not worth it. Right. Which is so sad because so it's sad. treatable. Yes. It's treatable.